You can hear it, right? Yeah, I hear the music. Are they gonna talk? Yeah, but it's supposed to be. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm really thrilled here. We're celebrating Sinister Wisdom 122, continuing the celebration of our 122nd issue on the theme of writing communities. Tonight, we're going to be talking about a special part of this book that is um, part of Francis Clayton's life story. Um, my name is Julie Enzer. I'm thrilled to have you here this evening and looking forward to spending a great hour with you. We began with a wonderful slideshow with images of Francis Clayton from Claire Koss and technical wonderment from Sierra Earl. We will be slowing, showing the slideshow again this evening. So if you missed part of it, you will get a replay. Uh, before we begin, as has become one of our traditions, I want to spend a moment for a land acknowledgement. We are all located in the United States or around the world, and many of us live on occupied unceded land. I am in what is now Dover, Florida, the traditional homelands and territories of the Seminole, as well as other groups, including the Calusa and the Takabaga. We all collectively pause to recognize the histories of war and colonization and to, manage, to imagine a wor and work for a world where we all have fair and equitable distribution of resources. You are welcome to um, type in the location of where you are um, into the chat. Um, and I do have a, I want to acknowledge the request for captions, um, which we had in an earlier one, and I do not see immediately how to turn on. So I'm going to look for that for a moment. And Max, if you would also look for that, I, I, we are using a different account. We were using my account and I wonder if I have not enabled them properly on this account. So uh, we will investigate that. Thank you to everyone who's entering their location of where they are. We are investigating uh, captions. And um, Max, if you would put that in the chat as well about the captions, that would be great. So we have a chakra block hour planned for you. Um, as always, we usually wrap up after an hour, eight o'clock here on the East Coast, and we include time at the end for our traditional dance number. So stay with us to the end to dance. At that point, you can unmute yourself, wave, and chat with friends. In case you're not familiar with Sinister Wisdom, Sinister Wisdom is a quarterly journal of lesbian literature and art. If you're not currently a subscriber, I encourage you to sign up for a subscription today by going to sinisterwisdom.org slash subscribe. A group of monthly sustainers are vital to Sinister Wisdom. If you are able to give three, five, or maybe $100 a month, you can sign up as a sustainer at sinisterwisdom.org slash sustainers. I think everyone who's on our um, Zoom program this evening who is a sustainer. I send out emails every month when the gift comes with behind the scene details and new information about what's coming for the journal. There are so many ways that lesbians lift up and support the work of Sinister Wisdom, and I appreciate them all. I do want to mention that our fall fundraising campaign is happening right now. One of the benefits of our strong fundraising campaign from last year is that we dropped a special gift in the mail to all Sinister Wisdom subscribers this year. Um, if you haven't received it, it will be coming in the next few days. I've heard from people around the country who have received it. We sent out a signed copy of Christos's book, Firepower, and we produced a brand new chat book of new poems by Christos called Her Eyes Are My Home. And um, both of those mailed free to all Sinister Wisdom subscribers as just a little bonus of all of the great things that lesbians do when we pool our resources together. So if you're not a subscriber, 
please do join us as a subscriber. And if you believe in and support the work of Sinister Wisdom, consider making a donation to the organization if you're able. It means a lot to everyone gathered this evening and countless other lesbians for whom Sinister Wisdom is valuable and important. Our usual housekeeping notes, which I will go through very quickly so we can get right on our program. Keep your microphone muted throughout the program. If we hear noise, we will mute you. There's an opportunity, as I mentioned at the end, to wave and cheer as we all dance together to the L word. As the program proceeds, if you want to show appreciation for readers, you can wave your hands at the, as readers go on, use the reaction emojis on Zoom, and also light up the chat on Zoom. We will have time for questions at the end. People can unmute and ask questions, or you can put them in the chat, and I will raise them up for folks. If you need technical assistance this evening, you can chat directly with Max Bakker. Um, Max is on tap for technical assistance for everyone. We are recording the event, and I did start the recording right at the beginning, and we'll make it available starting on Thursday at sinisterwisdom.org backslash SW122. If you are eagerly waiting for your issue, you should probably email me because they um, have been received by about 90 or 95 percent of all subscribers. Um, so if you don't have your issue, email me julietsinisterwisdom.org and I'll get a replacement copy out to you. We have noticed a lot more lost copies as a result of the challenges our United States Postal Service has. And also if you're waiting for your issue of the Christos, if you're waiting for your mailing of the Christos package, I will suggest a way to help you with the wait, and that is to order the 2022 Sinister Wisdom calendar. I feel a little bit like Ron Popeil. Um, we are back to the larger format of the calendar. It's gorgeous, and I'd love for you to have it on your wall and for you to share it with all of the other luscious lesbians in our life. Our life, your life, everyone's life. So that's the end of my announcements. Um, this evening is about three wonderful things and I'm so excited about it. I knew when we published uh, this material on Francis Clayton that I wanted to do an event dedicated to this work. The three things we're going to do is first, Claire Koss is going to talk to us personally about Frances Clayton and how her documentary project of Clayton's life came into being and came to be published in this issue of Sinister Wisdom. Second, we're expecting Elizabeth Lord Rollins to join us and read from her tribute to Francis Clayton. Then we're gonna show the slideshow again. And finally, in the, in the second half of our hour, Cheryl Clark, a Sinister Wisdom board member, will be in conversation with Claire and Elizabeth. Together, all of them will talk about Francis Clayton's life and what it means for all of us today. So, I'm very excited about all of this, as I hope you can tell. And I want to begin by introducing the inimitable Claire Koss. Claire has been such a delight to work with on this project. Claire Koss is a playwright, um, librettist, activist who lives in New York City with her co-conspirator, Blanche Wisencook. Among Claire's plays are Dr. Dubois and Miss Ovington, Lillian Wald at home in Henry Street, and Emmett down in my heart. In 2022, next year, just around the corner, Label Noir, an Afro-German theater in Berlin, will present, and forgive me for the German that I'm going to butcher here, uh, Label Noir will present Emmett, Teeth in Maimen Herzen. Emmett Till, the opera by composer Mary Watkins and librettist Claire Koss will premiere in a concert version in New York City in the spring of 2022. It's gonna be a really big year for you, Claire. Uh, Claire's um, edited book, The Ark of Love, an anthology of lesbian love poems, which I'm sure many of you have and have cherished or maybe have lost in some tragic breakups only to repurchase again when you were re-in love. This wonderful book that Claire edited was a Lambda Literary Award finalist. And you can find out more information at Claire's website, which I will put into the chat, clairecost.com. So Claire, I'm thrilled to welcome you this evening. And I hope you'll start off by telling us a little bit about this project and how it came into being. Thank you, Julie, and thank you to the editors for this splendid issue of Sinister Wisdom. And it's so great to be in this issue with a tribute to Alex Dobkin, our troubadour and 
and Jewel Gomez's Cole poem, which is a tribute to Audrey, uh, and to have the interviews with Francis be with uh, our community in this very open and published way. It's, it's like a dream come true for me, and I'm sure for Blanche and all of us. Uh, and I see that Elizabeth has made it, um, Elizabeth Lord Rollins, uh, who is a physician at OBGYN and, and she needs somebody cover for her so she can be on this panel with us, which thank you so much, Beth. It's just amazing that you're here and Cheryl too. I'm so happy that uh, we're gonna be having a conversation. Um, and Blanche is a little surprise guest here. <laughs> she has a story that she wants to add to the evening. Um, thank you everybody for zooming in to celebrate our beloved friend, Frances Clayton, who was a psychologist and the first full woman with tenure in the psychology department at Brown University. And when we all met, um, Blanche and Audrey and I were married, we had husbands, and Francis had a PhD and, and, and a tenured position. <laughs> so when we decided um, to leave our husbands, she left her position at Brown and moved down to New York so she and Audrey could live together and uh, with Jonathan and Elizabeth, uh, whose father was Ed Rollins, Audrey's husband. So, um, we became a chosen family and we had the most wonderful ride for 17 years when the length of time that Audrey and Francis were together. Uh, and then when they parted and their relationship ended, uh, Audrey went to St. Croix and Francis went to Watsonville, California and the children went on their ways into their futures. So. Um, we stayed very close, of course, to Audrey and to Frances, and we would visit Frances um, a couple of times a year. She found out that Watsonville, the fog would dry it with a uh, roll in in the morning and the evening, and it just exacerbated her arthritis to such an extent that she, she couldn't bear it anymore. And um, she had lost her closest sister, she had lost her therapist, she had lost her relationship, and she just and she had lost a good friendship out there. So, she, at the encouragement of Beth and Jonathan, she moved to Sun City, Arizona, where her two older sisters lived and her brother-in-law, to be out of the uh, dampness. And it really made all the difference for her. Those first years, she was really comfortable and out of pain. And that's when um, Blanche and I would visit twice a year because she couldn't leave the desert. Um, and we had uh, this idea, Francis and I, to interview her, that I had taken speed writing when I was in high school because my mother said I needed a backup. <laughs> if I was gonna be in the theater, I definitely needed to be a secretary. So um, <laughs> I had speed writing and Francis kept saying she wanted to write her memoir. And she just never could get to it. And it was, um, it was always a kind of a, a longing for her to get her story told in some form. So I offered to interview her. So each time we went down, uh, we would do another set of interviews in my speed writing and I would transcribe them and uh, then we would go over them together in the next time. So that happened um, over you know, several years and she was, um, she was really pleased. And the photographs that you saw on the show, she, she selected, she had C. diff and we were in her hospital room covered in you know, the white garb that you have to protect yourself in. And she wanted to pick out those photographs even in that state. So I sat next to her on the bed in the hospital and we were picking out the photographs. Um, so that has her, that has her, um, mark on those that, that were chosen. Um, so there, um, it, it went along pretty well. And here they are. Julie, I can't believe you've published them. That's just so great. And Beth has written a beautiful afterward. Um, 
uh, talking about Francis as, as a parent. Um, I have a few stories. I just would like to read a couple of them from this, um, from this beautiful book. Uh, I don't know whether you saw the picture of Francis as a little girl in her high button shoes. Here it, here it is. Yes. So see those little shoes there. This is the story. One Sunday morning during church service in Bone Gap, mother and I sat in the first pew listening to father preach. We were dressed up in our Sunday best. I wore high button shoes that went just above the ankle. A wasp crawled down my sock and fell into my left shoe. A sharp sting on the side of my foot made me jerk back. Mother pinched me hard on my thigh. I was supposed to keep stock still while father preached. A second sting and I jerked my foot again. Mother pinched my arm even harder. I forced myself to keep still while the little trapped wasp stung me over and over until it died way down there in the bottom of my shoe. It's just extraordinary to me that we have a picture of her in those little shoes with that wasp. Um, she was very conscious uh, of race as a young person. Uh, they were lived in Illinois. Her father was a a preacher and they were very poor. And she, um, she uh, wanted to tell this story about her first consciousness of racism. We lived in a segregated world. So the racial context of the song she referred to before didn't become conscious until I met black students for the first time. She had never seen a black person before until she went to, they moved to Fairfield where she went to Fairfield High School. Black people were not allowed to live in Fairfield where I attended high school as a freshman. My sophomore year, we moved to Harrisburg, Illinois where I met black students at Harrisburg High School. They could eat in the cafeteria but had to wait until the end of the line after all the white kids had gone through. One day I was late and came running down the steps to find the white students all inside the cafeteria. The black students were in line. I couldn't cut ahead of them, so I stood at the end of the line. The black students at the head of the line gestured for me to go ahead. I went to the front and never got over the guilt. I felt it was the first time I had been called on to make a stand and I did not make a stand. I looked at myself and the unfairness and the tyranny of racism. I looked at myself and knew by looking at myself, I was doing what white people have trouble doing. And then another quick one, which um, growing up as a PK, a preacher's kid, um, she would, you, you know, she learned that you, you're either good or you're bad. The people I knew where I grew up in the Midwest, didn't really act as if there were an explanation for behavior other than you were a good person or a bad person or a mixture. My father used to get very upset because I couldn't sit still while playing in the room where he was writing his sermons. He would finally get totally exasperated and shout, Louise, sit still. Why can't you sit still? I heard this not as a real question, but as a way of saying I was bad for not sitting still. I asked myself the real question, why couldn't I sit still? I never found an answer. I decided I was just bad. Well, I pretty well stopped trying to explain behavior until I took a psych course my first year in college, night school. It came as a thunderclap that the professor was really saying there were explanations for behavior that were not good or bad. I asked him if this didn't mean that people weren't responsible for what they did, he said we had to hold people responsible, but that there were reasons for what they did. I thought this was the most exciting idea I had ever heard. I spent most nights after I left class trying to figure out all the implications of my behavior being a result of something beside bad or good. And the last story is um, something that really tickles me. <laughs> She had such a sense of humor. 
she she went out for a drink with this girl she was very attracted to when she was a student in, in Minneapolis. That night we went to a neighborhood bar for a drink. We talked for about an hour and drank Ham's 3% beer. We were really flirting as we filled each other in on who we were, but it wasn't labeled. She told me there was a younger girl she knew and had been close to, but they had a fight and were no longer close. Of course, I understood they had been lovers and no longer were. The thing I think that came close to putting those who we were out in the open was when I asked her, what was the medal around her neck? She replied that it was the virgin. I said, one can do worse than have a virgin around one's neck. We both blushed. She looked shocked and so did I. I heard what had come out of my mouth, but I couldn't believe it. We dropped that topic right there, but we never forgot it. And um, that's something that Blanche and I, <laughs> one, can do, one can do worse than have a virgin around one's neck. Anyway, Francis, um, Francis and I talked every Sunday night and um, we shared a supervisor for two years when we were both in our psychotherapy practice. And um, we had many great trips with Francis when we visited at Sun City, she took us to all the great national parks in the Southwest. And um, it was just, just the most wonderful friendship ever. Over to Beth. Yeah, over to Beth. You're muted. Yeah, I guess, I guess I'll unmute. Okay, wow. What a beautiful gathering. Wow. Th thank you so much. Um, you know, the sinister wisdom to Julie, this is, is magnificent. Uh, it's beautiful to see all these faces. Um, I'm just, uh, I guess, going to read um, from um, my afterward. I knew Frances loved us, but I thought it was because she had to. We were a package deal. And if she wanted a life with her mom, it was going to be with us as well. It was a long time before I realized that Frances loved us as her own children. And it was even longer before I came to consciously value what her parenting had given to me. I was 15 when I first got my period. My mother was away reading at SUNY Syracuse and I'd overslept that Saturday, missing the art class at the College of Staten Island I'd lobbied my parents for. You know, Beth, these concerts, these courses aren't free. You need to get your ass in gear for these Saturdays, Francis called up the stairs. That's when I discovered I was lying in an album-sized circle of sticky, weird-smelling blood. When I got downstairs and told Francis, her face instantly softened. Oh, she said, no wonder. You might actually find you're more tired during those period weeks or sometimes even the week before. She offered to give me a ride to the store to pick up period supplies, a trip my brother and I routinely made on foot. And when we got to the store and I hesitated in the front seat, she said, you want me to go in and get them this time? And I gratefully nodded yes. I was super embarrassed at the messiness, at the smell. I was also grieving, feeling like I'd never really be a kid again. And I missed it already, but I couldn't believe that Francis, the keeper of schedules, the enforcer of family rules, the raised eyebrow when I was embroidering the truth or outright lie, understood so completely and was willing to do whatever it took to make this hard day easier for me. Francis's love came without castigation, but not without judgment. Francis had a well-developed sense of right and wrong and shared it with me and my brother. Francis was the disciplinarian in our house, but it was not until my early adulthood that I understood that most of the rules came from our mother, Audrey, or that we kids didn't hear about anything until it was hammered out between the two of them. At family meetings, if Jonathan and I were falling short on our chores or if there was a new rule to be implemented, our mom would turn to Francis expectantly and Francis would relay the message. I remember well how shameful it felt to fall short in Francis's eyes 
and how great it felt when she praised me for doing a good job. I knew for sure that Francis didn't hand out compliments easily. So I see it's 7.30. So with that, I'll wrap up. But I would just say that, you know, the other thing that I really learned from Francis, and really I didn't get a lot of this until I was an adult, she had just the most amazing moral sense about her work as a therapist. You know, I still run into people periodically who stop me on the street and say, oh, you're Francis' kid. I saw your picture in my therapist's office. She never talked about anything or anyone, um, not even halfway, not even sideways. She was an absolute hero, but it was all in these little rooms between two people. The most important work, the most, most earth-shaking work. Um, so I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. She really, uh, she was a brilliant psychoanalyst or psychoanalytic psychologist. And we know people who were her clients who just tell us how much they love her always and how much she gave to them. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Are you going back to work now? No, I'm going to hang out. The phones are ringing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for arranging that you could appear with us tonight. I just so appreciate it. I'm sure everybody does. It's so great to be here. Great to see everybody. And Blanche. Great. So we have Blanche. So we should we have Blanche share a little bit and then we'll show the slideshow again and then we'll we'll bring Cheryl in and you guys can all talk together. Absolutely. Thank you so much. This is so exciting. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about Frances, the poetry lover, and the poetry reciter. Um, for many years, she would, be, she would repeat William Butler Yeats's, I will arise and go now and go to Innisfree. And she, she read poetry with such drama. And one day, very recently, going through Diane de Prima's Revolutionary Letters, 1971, I have a note here, Frances Clayton's second love poem. And her first love poem, I really, I, I was, I will arise and go now and go to Innisfree. But this is called Pictures in the Smoke by Dorothy Parker. And it's really wonderful that her second love poem is by that witty poet, Dorothy Parker. And she, and, the first, and it goes. Oh, gallant was the first love and glittering and fine. The second love was water in a clear white cup. The third love was his, and the fourth was mine. And after that, I always get them all mixed up. <laughs> and there's something so perfectly, Francis, about that poem. Thank you. Thank you, Blanche. Max, why don't, while we absorb all the goodness that our speakers have given us, we'll watch the, the, um, we'll watch the, the video one more time um, and then we'll bring in Cheryl.
Cheryl, do you want to do you want to start off this next section? Certainly, Julie. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thanks to Julie Inzer for all you do to keep lesbians in the world, lesbians and lesbianism in the world. And um, thanks to our lovely conversationalists, Claire Koss, Elizabeth Lord Rollins, and Blanche Cook, all lesbians in the world. I must say I am uh, humbled and honored to be once again with the three of you and think we should keep our show on the road. Weren't we together at Alice Austin? Yeah. That's, that's what I mean. See, we're a, we're a quartet. <laughs> but let me reiterate how honored I am to be here and to be talking about Francis Clayton, whom I knew all too briefly two memorable times, one at a party, and I stumbled into a bedroom <laughs> to get something from my coat pocket. And Francis and Audrey were laying across the bed kissing. <laughs> they laughed at my surprise. I went back out. And later, I came back in to get my coat to go home. And they were still there. <laughs> <laughs> they were talking. They weren't kissing this time. The second time was when Francis accompanied Audrey to New Brunswick, New Jersey, for a failed poetry reading. They came laughingly up the street. I apologize profusely for the zero turnout. And they both said, oh, you're not far from Staten Island. It was true. And uh, thanks to you, Claire Koss, for uh, making the interviews you conducted with Francis available to the Sinister Wisdom audience. And I must say your foreword was uh, very moving. If my calculations are correct, now, now I'm turning it over to the conversationalists. But if my calculations are correct, Francis Clayton was 42 at the time of Stonewall. Yet she was living as a lesbian before Stonewall. And I wonder if the three of you could talk about her as a friend, a role model, a parent in relationship to Audre Lorde and beyond Audre. So I'm turning it over to the three of y'all now for a while. Then I'll cut <laughs> you off. She was a real, really great, steady friend. You could just, she was so solid, such a solid person. And um, she had a great joy in life she really and and she had so much passion and she was so powerful the two of them audrey and francis were these two super energetic powerful women truly and very different in some ways but they just um it was like you know you could just feel the energy in in the room when they walked in 
um, and it was uh, it was exciting. It was an exciting. It was an exciting time because the seventies were when everybody was, you know, coming out and writing and theater and poetry and it was uh, it was just a thrilling decade to be together. And Beth was growing up and Jonathan, and it, it felt like, you know, we always spent Christmas, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, New Year's Eve, birthdays, all the occasions together as a family. And um, it just was, it was so high, it was so heady. And we all uh, kept reading each other's work and we'd attend each other's you know, productions or it, it's events. like, what? And events. And events. And um, we just had so many incredible memories of um, great moments. And then when Audrey started wearing the gala and, and having a kind of different presentation, I don't know. And then what Beth wrote in, her, in your afterward that, that she made possible the trips to Africa, right? and um, had um, did just a lot was going on that we didn't know <laughs> that we learned from your afterward. So it was... <laughs> yeah, I, I think that um, one thing that really stands out for me is, um, I mean, yeah, Frances was living as a lesbian before Stonewall, but she was just, really in herself like Francis just um had this incredible unshakable sense of fairness and she was really solid about what she thought um and she could get really deeply angered um at anything that she felt was oppression leaning on the underdog um and you know whatever form that took so you know she was an anti-racist before anti-racism was popular um you know i i didn't know her then but i should imagine she lived her life as a lesbian that's where she found herself she almost got married three times um, and I, I'm sure she cared about these guys. And then she's like, what am I doing? <laughs> oh, what am I doing? Um, you know, she had a deep, deep love of animals. And at the same time, um, was very, you know, it kind of like moved people into a gentle correction whenever she felt that folks were attributing human traits to animals. Like, don't anthropomorphize. That was the thing. These are animals. She, you know, she was ready to meet animals where they were. You know, <laughs> <laughs> survival. That's it. That's what it is. Um, she had two cats, right? Yeah, she had yeah. two cats. And I, I mean, in terms of, you know, fairness, right and wrong, it, sometimes I think sometimes it would take my mom by surprise. Um, you know, one thing that I really remember, there was this, um, and we're talking like 1972, maybe 1973, this little cartoon book called The Little Dick, like ended up in our house. I think somebody who wrote it, it just sent it as a present. It was a very feminist kind of like, you know, early feminist type cartoon book. And it hung out in the living room for a couple of days. And I remember I overheard a conversation. I don't think they knew I was listening. <laughs> France, Francis said, Audrey, you can't leave this in the living room. She said, why not? It's funny. She said, no, 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 no. You know, we have a boy in this house. We have a young man in this house. No, we can't. No, this has got to go. So, you know, as feminist, as lesbian as she was, she had an eye for, you know, but we're the majority in this house. 
we're not going to turn around and revisit this oppression on the youngest member of the family who happens to be male. Mm-hmm. And that kind of took, I think, my mama back a little bit. But that was very much a piece of who Francis was. Mm-hmm. It's great. Mm-hmm. That's a great story. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It is a great story. Mm-hmm. Oh. I remember one more time. I think it was a party at Blanche and Claire's. Blanche, did you used to have a punching bag? Did you? I do have a punching bag. Still still has it. I have a punching bag. (laughs) I know. I'd never seen one in real life. (laughs) Francis was bending down, getting something underneath it. And I was getting ready to hit it. Not that I knew what I was doing. And she looked up at me like I was crazy. She <laughs> said, you better, you, you better check yourself. But anyway, um, Claire, I'd like to uh, get your take on Francis as a psychotherapist. And... Uh, especially since you said you shared the same supervisor because you too were a psychotherapist. Um, Yes, Uh, could you talk about that a little? I mean, uh, sure. uh, Francis uh, as a professional person. mm -hmm. Well, she she had thought when they when she left Brown and came to the city that she would continue in academia. And I think she taught at Queens some courses for a while, but then she realized it was gonna be hard to get a full-time position, tenured position like she had in in, um, um, Providence. And uh, so that's when she kind of started to retrain to become a a psychotherapist. And, she was um, she was good because she was tough. She was tough and caring, and um, and you couldn't pull anything over on her. You know, she she was wise, very wise, and we uh, we shared um, a wonderful supervisor for two years. Um, Diane Shaneberg, who's a psychologist, and she had a brownstone on the east side. And uh, so we would talk about our cases together with with Diane, who was brilliant. And um, it was just so revealing, you know, how how she um, how she cared and how steady she was and how she wasn't afraid to look into herself. You know, we we have to use ourselves as our tool and what kind of feelings get induced in us by clients and take that as you know how that works with the client with people in their lives. And she was not afraid to go into really scary places. You know, mm. we we both supported each other on that. And um, we had been through a, a kind of hard time with a, a psychotherapist that we had both seen. And so we shared we shared some of that, and it was. Uh, we, we really learned from each other. And Diane, Diane was just amazing. She could keep her mouth shut for the longest time, which is like the hardest thing to do. You know? I mean, a therapist has to keep her mouth shut, right? I mean, you just have to listen. It's like, and uh, the two of us went on and on about this. It's coming back. Uh, and um, Diane listened, and then she would say something Anyway, and then we would go have lunch at um, on the corner of uh, Broadway and 96th Street. There was a kind of, and then we would kind of process what we had just learned and what we had talked over. So it was a very, very close, very intimate um, insight that we would have with each other on how we each worked and and what were our strong points and what you know, what things did we have trouble with and what things were we easy with and 
and uh, we were very different. We were very different, but we um, we were dedicated to being the very best possible psychotherapists we could be. So we, um, you know, we always took advantage of working with a supervisor, just to talk, just to have that kind of luxury of uh, understanding yourself and your work better, so that you could be a better practitioner. Thank you, Claire. That was very illuminating. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to read this quote from um, Dr. Lord Rollins. You know who you are, don't you? Uh, <laughs> quote, Francis was an anti-racist before it was fashionable and she was clear-eyed about white privilege before there were roadmaps for whites on how to spot it and what to do about it. Could you talk a little more about uh, Francis's commitment to living an anti-racist life? And you two can chime in if you wish. I mean, I, I think I probably don't even know the half of it because I think a lot of it went on sort of, you know, out of my earshot, out of my, you know, something between the grownups. Um, mm. One thing that I will always appreciate that I didn't appreciate at the time was how protected I was by my parents, by the grownups in my life. I know I didn't appreciate it at the time. I was constantly trying to listen in on their conversations, and um, in That's adulthood, what you're to I was going to say in adulthood, I'm really glad I didn't hear more. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're supposed to listen. I in. mean, you know, <laughs> but um, you know, I guess it began with seeing. You know, it began with seeing. I mean, um, when we were in Africa, and I also talk about this in the afterward. You know, it it was. Francis, who said to Audrey, have you noticed something weird about the way everybody receives us in restaurants and when we walk into the lobby of hotels? And Audrey's like, as tourists, I mean, what are you talking about? Francis said, you know, they're acting as if they think you're the maid or something. Like, I don't, you know, they, I mean, yeah, I get it. They're not going to see us as a couple, but, you know, um, they think, you know, on some level that the children are attached to me and you're the maid or you're taking care of things. And, and Francis said, well, I know what to do about that. And so the next time we were at a restaurant, Francis did all the ordering after consulting, you know, privately hushed tones with Audrey about what she wanted to eat as if speaking to the waiter was sort of below Audrey. <laughs> and they, they both smoked at this point. It was before they quit. And when um, my mom got ready to have a cigarette, Francis would quickly whip out a lighter and <laughs> light her cigarette for her, open every door, you know, make, make clear, like, you know, complete um, just out there display of of being in service to <laughs> this African American woman and and her two kids, this you know white blonde headed woman, and you know in West Africa, which is where we were, not too many years away from full colonization, right? We're talking it was 1974, um, so Benin was still called the Homie, mm -hmm. um. You know, it, it was it was a mind blower for people in all the hotels and the restaurants where we were, you know, and it was Francis who came up with that and Francis who had the vision to see what was going on at the beginning. So so that's, you know, just sort of one instance, I'd say. Um, but the other thing is that, you know, I had as a really light skinned black little girl i had a lot of identity issues i think and 
you know, Francis was ready to listen to me, but she never, she's like, I, I can't understand what you're going through. And I'm not going to pretend to, and I'm not going to pretend that this is easy. Um, and I really respect that. And, and as and now as a step parent myself, I know how that must have cost her. <laughs> I know how hard that is now. Um, so that's what I'd say. Professor Clark. Who told you? <laughs> this is what I want to know. Who told you you were light skinned? Oh, hi, Yella. I don't. I, I didn't need to. I didn't need to ask. We'd go out to Jerry's Den. And they'd be like cutting my mom's hair, cutting my brother's hair. I'm like, can you do my hair? Oh, honey, baby, we'll do your kind of hair here. <gasps> <laughs> so, you know, that's just a reality of my growing up. But that's okay. My mother said, hey, look, America's not confused about who you are. Don't you be confused about who you are. <laughs> that's okay? true, though. That's, <laughs> right. that's, she was right. <laughs> so, that's great. Fair that's enough. Can, I have can, a, I have a, a mini uh, a mini thing to just read about um, <laughs> following up on that. Uh, this was when uh, she um, they wanted to in, integrate um, a residence, uh, and they were at, when when she was at um, Min, Min, Minneapolis or Indiana University. Anyway, she said, "I joined the NAACP." When I told mother she was scared to death, thought I had joined the communist party. My sister Christine insisted I had to quit. I said, the NAACP can't be communist. Eleanor Roosevelt belongs. <laughs> Christine answered, you don't think she's the communist? I wouldn't be a bit surprised. <laughs> that is anyway, funny. There's, there are many instances in the um, interviews where she comes to consciousness about having to be activist. There's a really great one where she, um, she got so mad that they weren't going to uh, integrate this residence that she was going to quit college. And this more experienced activist said, you got to be kidding. You're in for the long haul or forget it. <laughs> right. uh, that was that was good yeah well thank you all so much it's it's my job to be the timekeeper here and although i want the conversation to go on forever i also want to um, fulfill our commitment to wrapping up i thank all four of you for joining us this evening for doing this event um, and also for doing this really wonderful work of helping us remember and contextualize francis clayton's life um, so that she is not forgotten this is of course central to what part, the mission of sinister wisdom so i appreciate all of you for the work that you've done for joining us this evening for sharing with us these really beautiful stories. I want to remind everyone that in three weeks on December 7th, we will be um, in this same space um, with subtitles on, hopefully, um, hearing Christos read from her new and old work. And so that's going to be a lovely evening, December 7th at 7 p.m. Um, at this point, Max is going to share our song, The L Word. Um, we'll unpin everybody from the screen and everyone can dance and sing and talk and wave and talk in the chat and do all of that. And then when the song ends, I will end the Zoom session. So, Max, go ahead. Thanks, Julie. Thank you so much, Julie. Thanks to all. Take Thank care. You. Thank, Thank you. you, Beth. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, so Great Mary. to see you. This is wonderful. Thanks, Lynch. Lepa yeah. from Serbia. Hey. Lepa. Lepa. <laughs> Charlotte Roxy. <laughs> Patsy, so good to see all of you. Yes, it is. Hi, Sherry. Come on and say the L word. It's the only chance you got to reclaim our name and not live in shame to try to improve our lot. Come on and say the L word. It's the Sherry only chance you got to stop the lying and denying. And come on and give it a shot. And everybody say, Let's be Would you look around?
watch somebody at first. Yeah. Yeah.